Hello guys, how's it going? I'm George Taylor, I'm the, I'm the founder of Gramercy, and today you're checking into the Gramercy vodcast. For today's guest, I've got Jackie Burnett, who is a South African financial strategist, business advisor, life coach, and more recently, the author of a brand new book, which is called Life's Not Yoga. So Jackie, thanks for being a guest on today's show. Let's get right to it. Life's Not Yoga, could you give us an insight into your new book and what it entails? Hi, George, and everyone out there. Um, George, thanks so much for having me here today. I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, my book, Life's Not Yoga, is a memoir, and it shares the journey of my multiple, and I say multiple, life traumas, which includes um, some of my nine near death experiences. And it's the journey of how I got lost in my life and lost with, uh, I guess, purpose and meaning is the best way to, to describe it, and then my road to recovery and to finding um, true purpose in life again. You also launched a movement called Dare to Be Love, kind of alongside the book as well. Um, I was just going to say, in a nutshell, what is that? The Dare to Be Love movement is actually rather simple, and it goes to the, my call to action. And my call to action is there are only two ways to be in life, and that is to be love or not. I'd like to just flesh it out a little bit, even though you said in a nutshell. And what does this mean? We're living in such a divided world and I think if we can, you know, sort of reflect on what's going on in the world at the moment at this present time and certainly what we've seen in America as to how divided people are. And the reason is that we, we are over attached to our beliefs at the moment. Um, worse yet, people are attached to beliefs that lack love. They're limiting, they're exclusive, they bring fear to us, they bring anxiety, judgment of ourselves and others and lots of conflict with others. And we are lacking in the world in beliefs that are just infused with love. And are unlimited and inclusive um, which bring joy harmony and and peace to all and we keep hearing about how to change and you know be happy it's about change your thoughts and you'll be happy but our ego is such an incredibly powerful thing and it holds on to our beliefs so tightly that if that more than often it's actually impossible to change our thoughts it is a painful and slow process but when we can examine and question our beliefs the process actually becomes much easier now we all know that our original beliefs come from our parents and as we get older they are shaped by our, by our teachers, by society, our life experiences and actually accepting what other t others tell us need to be true. The scary thing is that seldom or almost worst of all we are never taught or actually encouraged to question if our beliefs are, in, are embedded in a good value system. So I have found that no matter how hard it is when I'm suffering or when I'm in pain or even just frustrated, when I actually find courage, when I go and access the courage to question if my belief is attached to, how it is actually attached to the pain story, then I can actually look at it and say, is this belief infused with love or not? That could be love for myself or love for the situation or love for the person who I might be frustrated with. It's hard, but when I'm honest enough to see this, I can then change the beliefs and open my beliefs that are filled with love. And then it becomes you know, unlimited and all inclusive. Then the work to change our thoughts or our spoken words or our actions in life is so much easier once we've had the, quest the courage to actually question, you know, what makes up our belief system. I agree with you and I'm actually a massive believer that myself. I mean, I've also been through a quite traumatic life like you have. Obviously not the same experiences, but similar, very similar. Quite a few of them. And I've also had a couple of near-death experiences myself, actually. Um, and one of the things that I have realised over the years is that emotional intelligence is key and also... Being fluid and flexible in the way you are is such a, a key thing. So, like, I don't define myself as one thing. You know, I'm always changing. I'm always evolving. I'm always questioning myself, asking myself whether whether I did things the right way. Is there a better way of doing things moving forward? Should I change this? Should I change that? How can I change that? And kind of always being very, um, I don't know what the word is, self analytical, <laughs> and knowing when I've kind of cocked up and made mistakes. And I think like the word we use here, I don't, I don't know what word you use in South Africa, but we use the word emotional intelligence. And that's the ability to be able to step outside yourself, look at yourself objectively and kind of soul search and dig deep, which I guess is kind of what you're saying, isn't it? That's kind of what you're, you're, you're leaning towards. Yes, very much so. Very much so. You've been extremely open, in fact, very, very open about some of these traumatic experiences that you've faced um now when we wrote the article about you one of the things that uh, stood out to me was how you open up about being abused by your father you'd also spoken about how you narrowly escaped being killed in a car accident and also probably worst of them all is two 
thankfully failed suicide attempts. Um, so I was going to say I'd really appreciate it if you could open up and talk about some of those things. Would that be okay? Um, George, before we actually talk about some of the experiences, I first want to say yes, I have, I have been very open. And I believe that it was imperative that I had to be open, particularly if I was going to talk about people who impacted my life and, and, and share what that meant for me. But I believe if we want to actually be spiritual revolutionaries in the world, then to bring about peace and harmony in the world, it's, it's not enough to just tie yourself to, to a tree. We need to live, learn individually to live beyond our shame stories, our guilt stories, and our blame stories. And as you said earlier, at the end of the day, you look at the things that you've done or how you could have done it better. And, and it's also, I remember saying in a talk once that somebody said to me, it's like, you have no fear. I said, no, I have fear. And at the end of every day, I wake up with fear, but I look at it and I do the best job I can. And at the end of the day, I look at it and I say, well, where had I, have I possibly made a mistake? Whom do I possibly need to phone and apologize to the next day? And find compassion inside myself. But as long as I'm trying and as long as I'm bringing a conscious choice to to want to do good to want to bring about um, goodness into the world so yes I've spilled my guts in the book there's no doubt about that and you will get to work, meet the worst of me um, you'll really get to meet the Jackie that you don't like um, but that was me then that's not who I am now and I had to learn to forgive myself for my self-loathing my judgments of things that happened to me um, and then once I found the space of healing for my personal shame for some of the things that I've done that you're not going to like me for or even guilt or shame for things that happened to me that I felt shame for that I didn't feel I could talk about. Well, then what was interesting for me is that all the blame disappeared and I was able to find love and acceptance not only for my life's traumas that came my way, but also learn to love the people who participate in bringing pain my way. So I don't know if there's any specific ones that you want to talk about. Um, no, I think you've kind of covered it, really. I mean, I think I think move, moving on from there, I mean, um, obviously, at the moment, depression is, I think it's fair to say, a bit of an epidemic, especially how isolation and COVID and, you know, job loss, family member loss, all that kind of thing has really sort of knocked this out of control. Um, so on that note, going, going through what you've been through and where you stand now in this kind of higher power place that you're now in, what advice do you have for anyone right at this moment who is going through similar traumas um, and who maybe feels trapped or even suicidal as, as, we, as we both have in the past? Um, what would you say to them? What is your message to them? Well, I think so many more people suffer from suicide ideation than, than necessary we know about or that people talk about. And in part two of my book, I'm actually heading up the mountains um, telling everyone I'm going to finish writing this book but I'm actually heading on a journey to take myself out and I don't tell anyone about it but I don't really know my ego is so in control of um, hiding my shame that I don't even know on some level that I'm doing it and I unpack that in the book so as you know but the thing the advice I can give them is to know is first you're not alone you know even in those in those moments when you you feel so alone you feel that there's absolutely no there it's to to, to somehow find the courage not to run and hide. I know my habitual behavior was always to run. I had the most amazing husband in the world, and not that he didn't have his faults, but I completely idolized this man, and in fact is he idolized me too, and we'd been together for you know well over a decade. But I went, I, what happened was, um, I would have moved mountains for him, but I was so busy trying to take care of him and not myself. So what happened is my childhood stories were re-triggered by nasty litigation with an international accounting firm. And it had to do with a decision that he made. And I felt my job was to protect him from any pain that this was bringing him as a result of a deal that he got involved in. But in the end, I ended up resenting him for giving up on his dreams. And soon I was lashing out at him. And what happens is when, we, when we're in some sort of pain, it's something that's triggering at us and we've got to somehow go and find the trigger story I ended up hating myself and so I ran from my marriage, not because he didn't love me and not because I didn't love him, but it was myself that I didn't love. So with suicide ideation, it's often very hard to say, even if somebody else has brought us pain, even if somebody else has hurt us, what we are doing is we're so busy struggling in the moment of pain that living through the pain just seems too traumatic. So we would rather opt out of life thinking that that's the answer as opposed to trying to find the trigger unlock the story so that we can then start to deal with the pain 
So my only advice is when you're feeling this, and I was sitting with a friend actually on Sunday and we were talking about this and he too suffers from suicide ideation, is you just got to breathe deeply. Because with breath, we have life. I use meditation often a lot, well every day, but I mean it's a very important part of my healing process. And then reach out to someone, and even if it means someone just comes and sits quietly with you and holds your hand, even if it means having the courage to tell them, don't speak to me, just be here. I once remember having a, at the start of part two, I write a poem, and it was at a stage where I was feeling very depressed and very fearful in the middle of writing this book. And I actually phoned my friend, I said, I'm going to actually handcuff myself, not that I have handcuffs, I would have to go out and buy someone, I'm going to handcuff myself to the heaviest piece of furniture, throw the key in the garden and come and look for me in five days because I know this is going to take five days to go through. But in some ways I was so scared of hurting myself. But once you, once, the, the bigger thing for me is getting through all of that, the biggest step that I had to take was actually getting some trauma therapy work. And I had done so much trauma therapy. I talk in my book that I had a PhD in therapy. I felt I'd had seen so many therapists. What I didn't realize or didn't know at the time, and there's only a lot of research that's coming out of this since 2015, is how much of it is stored in our DNA. So for me, it was the body modality work that I started doing to release the trauma stories. And I had so many that the, you know, when I started the trauma therapy, even stuff that I had suppressed and forgotten about that I thought was unimportant started coming out. And I did that through things like TRE, EMDR, I use yoga, I use meditation and other modalities, but find a physical modality to do that. And then with that, I realized that what I was doing is I was holding on to these stories with my belief system. And by finding the courage to question my beliefs, I could see that suppressing my feelings only brought me pain. And I ended up with suicide ideation, depression, self-loathing, massive anxiety, debilitating anxiety, the judgment of others, fibromyalgia, and chronic migraines that were leaving me with convulsions. As I say, through, through trauma therapy, I also learned in the modalities that I did to expand my perception, which then in turn allowed me to release my illnesses and thrive. I don't suffer from any of those anymore, so. <laughs> thank you for the answer and thank you for, uh, you know, for the, for the insight. I'm sure a lot of people will appreciate it, so thank you very much. Um, so obviously with all your wisdom and all your experience and all the, the spiritual journey you've been on, quite obviously you're a life coach now, which, you know, makes complete sense. Who, who wouldn't be in your scenario? Um, so what I was going to say is, obviously, your life experiences have informed the way you help people, clearly, as you're sort of discussing now. I was going to say, what is your approach towards helping people get their lives back on track and also to achieve, you know, happiness, fulfillment and their dreams? Well, before I studied as a life coach, I'd always done work. I'd always sort of been mentor and helped people and felt the need to help people. But what I realized is as I was unpacking this, you know, during the early stages of um, when, my, when I talk at the end of my book where I end up going and do these studies, is that I was projecting my life stories onto everybody else and I wasn't healing. So now having qualified as a life coach, I realized it's important that, you know, because we don't want to project our stories onto our clients. But at the end of the day, we are human after all. So yes, my life experience have helped me understand how hard it is to recover from emotional abuse and from physical traumas. Before healing, I was just a victim and a survivor, but I wanted to thrive and not only survive. And so without doubt, as I continue to learn to thrive in life, and I see that as a daily practice, learning to thrive in the world, and it definitely does inform the way that I help people. So that's dealing with your first question. Your second question um, goes to, you know, what is my approach towards helping people get their lives back on track and, and therefore achieving their dreams. I also once again see this as two, two, two questions. If you want to get your life back on track after a trauma, you need to regroup, take some time out. You've got to actually stop and look at what's really going on. And so you need a bit of a rest and a pause period. So take time to be silent and to listen to what kind of healing you really need. You do need healing. Healing is not something we do on our own. Be patient, but don't wait for the healing to come your way. We have to actually step up and go to the world and ask for the world for support, be that in therapies or um, it, with, with a friend or somebody. Sometimes it can be difficult with a friend because they'll project their stories onto you. And I think specifically of um, someone dear to me who was raped. And I was all I wanted to do was hold her and fix her, but I remember saying to her one day, are you going to give the perpetrator one night or the rest of your life? And there was a light that came on for her in, in, in that moment. And I said to her, so all I want you to do today is wash your hair. 
So do something every day for yourself in terms of nurturing yourself until you're strong enough to do you know modalities that are, are, are that require a lot more energy and effort. But don't sit on the couch. It it, it doesn't serve us. We don't get anywhere. There, there is a time for that, but your whole life will be on the couch if you don't get off the couch. You're not going to lose the weight. It doesn't matter what you're dealing with if you're trying to get back on track. You have to actually make the momentum towards what you want to achieve because we all want to heal. And um, when it comes to achieving your dreams, well, I, I believe and I've always believed, but it's something I've really only, and I talk about it in my early childhood, but it's something that I lost touch with, is the importance of manifestation. So once we set that dream, and how do we manifest and bring it to reality? Well, I believe that all dreams that are infused with love will be, will be manifest and made manifest and achieved. So, we, but we can't just throw our dream out into the universe and sit and go like this and meditate and wait for it to land on our lap. That's not going to happen. So I have a, you know, a very set formula. Set the vision, be clear about what it is, and never waver from the vision. The path will do this, but don't waver from the vision. What is it that you want to create? It's about creation. It's like that flower that opens up when you can actually see that end result. Keep that as your vision. Know when to take action. Don't try use force. Stay with your individual sense of power. Force is not the answer. And there's lots of fabulous reading around um, power versus force. Stay in motion. Keep moving. Keep moving towards it. Little steps every day. Enjoy the journey. When fear presents, dance with it. Don't let it stop you. I have been on my knees so many times with fear. It's going to happen, but just date it. Do not become attached to the outcome. I think that's a very important thing because if we're too attached to the outcome, the ego gets overly involved. So your vision is the end vision, but don't attach yourself to the outcome as to how that happens. So stay alert and be open to what presents its way along the path. There's no right way. There's just a path. Choose a path and move with it. If there's too much resistance, therein lies the answer of the things that you need to hear and shift the path. But make sure that when you change your path, that it always matches your vision. With attachments, unfortunately, it blocks our energy. And then we, we actually fail to receive the gifts that are coming from the outside that, that are there to help us along the way. And then the most important thing that I had to learn, and I think I'm so grateful for my teachers in, in San Francisco where I did my coaching studies, is get out of your own way and don't give up. I had to get out of my way so many times. And... I think maybe that came from being a survivor and thriving out of that banner, but my ego held on to it. I had to get out of my way, and for me particularly, it was learning to be vulnerable and open and honest about what I was ashamed of. Thank you, Jackie. Um, now, I know that you have dabbled in a few business ventures, you know, over the years, so you certainly got a little bit of experience in that. Um, uh, Gramercy, as you know, is a digital publisher, so we specifically focus on consumer and retail startup companies and small businesses anything that's kind of physical product that you can pick up with your with your hands that's kind of what that's our, our special is what we deal with now at the moment there are a lot of people launching new startups people that never thought they ever would because you know they're at home they've been made redundant they've got all this free time in their hands they're having these spiritual awakenings they're having these epiphanies and they're saying hey I, I, i've been wanting to do this my whole life now's the time right and they're doing it so now it it is a tough time to do it. I mean, there's never an easy time to do it, but it is a tough time to do it. So I was going to say, do you have any business advice? Now, I know that's quite a general, generalistic question, so just don't worry about you know being too, too open about it. But do you have any business advice that you can give to those people right now that are on that journey or just about to get on that journey? Uh, you know, I so love the fact that you said that these people have been saying, I've always wanted to do it. I guess the number one thing is do what you love. Do what you love. I wanted to be a writer as a young girl and I got caught up as a result of fear and parental narrative and issues with my dad and I took on all those stories and went into commerce and business. I'm not sorry for that. It was a journey I had to travel. I don't believe in living with regrets. But coming back in my 40s and saying I'm going to be a writer, oh my goodness, I have been on my knees. I have sacrificed everything for it. So the same applies for the previous question. In good times and bad times, the principles are the same. Set the vision set the vision and move just keep moving in the direction and just keep taking little steps at a time what I've seen over the span of my own career is that 
particularly when I've worked with startups, is that when people, they'll have an excellent vision and they know that in their heart is right, but then fear sort of, or, or, or events happen along the way, or the ego kind of pulls them in a direction, and they forget the vision, and then the business actually starts moving in a different direction. I'm not saying that things aren't going to happen that grow and evolve, but as long as you actually stick into that original vision, what did you want to create? And if that, that vision is set in creating goodness in the world and creating something magnificent that people can enjoy, then I believe that um, that set vision, you know, will, will manifest. It will come to life. You know, the, the, the journey of business and life is not linear. There's no straight line. But when the business keeps shining the light on the vision of what you want to create, that creation will happen. How does one actually write a book? I mean, I've always wanted to write a book. Um, the only reason I haven't done it is because there's time. I will do it one day. But for someone like me or for the next guy that's listening to this, you've done it. You, you've got there. What do we, I mean, apart from obviously typing out the words, which is the obvious thing, right? What else is required to get a book off the ground? Like, what do you have to do? Well, I am going to start off by saying the first thing you've got to do is you've got to just sit down and write. And you've already covered that. Okay, so. But once you've once again so for example writing a, a book with the vision that i set for myself and this book took a lot, a lot more than just sitting and sitting down and writing as i wanted this book to connect with others and i wanted it, them people to be able to connect with their story by sharing my story so you've got to look at it from a business point of view if you want it to be com com commercially viable because if you're just writing a book that you want to share with friends and family that's a very different thing or if you're writing an academic book but for me this was about um actually bringing something to the world i believed in terms of sharing my story so that people could identify with their own pain so the first thing i had to do is i had to realize that whilst i had you know achieved things in the commercial world i was a beginner as a writer and i needed to learn to crawl before i walked i then cried a lot i then attended a lot of writing workshops and creative workshops and i realized just how little i knew and then i cried some more <laughs> and then i worked with very skilled writing coaches to elevate my writing and teaching, you know, and they taught me how to write better. I had to dance with my fears a lot, and I had to admit, you know, what, how much I still needed to learn. A big part of writing as well is listening to the silent voice. I believe, and, and, and Ruth, um, I can't think of her name now, but there's a beautiful quote about the writing comes to you. You have to write it. It speaks through you and it presses through you. So make time to be silent, to listen to that, and then to do the writing. Um, so I do that obviously to get my ego and get myself out of the way through my meditation practice. Be prepared to make sacrifices. I gave up many, if not all luxuries to ensure that this project came to its completion. Um, so it, it's not something just you write a book and you know, that's the end result. There's, there's, you, you have to understand that this is an industry that's highly efficient, very, very established. And I had to look at it from a business point of view and apply all of the, the brilliant teaching out there and, and understanding of what it means to write a book for people to be able to read, want to read, um, enjoy, want to share. Um, I had to make a conscious decision every day to love the journey, even the days when it was so hard that I wanted to give up. And I can tell you that it was more than a thousand times. I had to learn how the reader wanted to enjoy a book by using a classical narrative arc. I had to respect what's important in my genre in terms of writing, what makes for for good, you know, for, for good, um, for good writing and good reading. The list goes on and on. But as a beginner, I had to understand that what makes for good writing, what makes for good reading, what makes for good entertainment, and then how does one actually package your message in a way so that people can connect to their own experiences, particularly in my genre, and then, you know, feel inspired to want to learn and grow for themselves. Everybody else, Jackie Burnett, the business advisor, life coach, and more recently, the author of Life's Not Yoga. I will be putting a link to Jackie's book in the description box below. So thanks very much for checking into this week's episode of the Grimacy Podcast, and we'll see you next week.